But we're going to start up again. Um, we're going to move on to a discussion session uh, for an hour before lunch. And we're going to be talking about um, some of the things we uh, heard about yesterday and today. Um, we can also pick up some of the um, other concepts about features that were presented on um, Monday and, and Tuesday as well. Um, these are additional focus questions that we didn't look at the other day. Um, we also have the ones from, um, I think, Tuesday we were thinking about. But um, it would be good f if someone came up with their own original questions that they thought were um, more important to discuss. Um, so if anyone wants to start off. <laughs> Okay. What about multi-species? Do we want to have biological interactions in the next generation model? Yeah, Anders. Do you just want me to come up with a question or something? Sure, yeah. <laughs> okay, something to discuss. Can, can we return to the residuals? Sure, yeah. yeah. If that's what so you if you have these compositional, compositional uh, data and you compute, let's say from a multinomial, you compute the residuals. In a perfect model, if you, have, if you simulate from that, won't they still be correlated the way you compute them? If you're simulating from a multinomial. Yeah. And, and, and then calculate the residuals. You're not removing the, the correlation between them. Yeah, so I yeah. don't think any of these... I mean, this has been a, I'll, I was actually just talking to Eric about this. I mean, one of the biggest challenges a lot of us face is with compositional data, particularly length data, um, you always see blob, if you're a bubble plot, right, there's a big bunch of blobs. And the question is, I, I've never seen anyone who can tell me whether, ah, you can, whether a blob is a random blob or it's a real blob, because I think that would be a very useful diagnostic for all of us. Um, I, as I told Eric, I was looking into the quasar literature because they're apparently looking for random quasar distribution, but apparently our residuals don't follow quasars. So uh, a fairly recent feature in, uh, in TMB is this one observation ahead residuals. And if you, if you do that, you can have a multinomial distribution. And if it's a true multinomial, then you get residuals that are returned that are perfectly normal, independent and perfectly normal. I think that's half the problem, but I mean, if you just fit the model to the data and you get your bubble plot, at what point do you say this bubble plot is not random? Um, it, and as I say, length data is particularly nasty because it's not really aged, it's not, doesn't have the same properties as age data do. So, you know, and, and I've looked at hundreds of those things and everyone goes, go, oh, it's a bubble plot, let's move on. Uh, Cause we don't know what to do with them. We know we should do something with them, but we don't know what it is, but we should be doing. No, but, but the, first thing would, the first thing would be that if the model was perfect, then you would get perfect residuals. That's step one. Well, there's also the issue of whether or not this lack of randomness is due to process error or observation error, and being able to detect that is, I think, equally important. And that plays out quite differently for length data, which is inherently correlated between bins. Um, whereas age data is much less likely so, unless you have aging error. So there's a lot of um, caveats on your degree to which you could separate those. But it is fundamentally important to uh, decide whether to downweight because it's you know, observation error problem, or is it, do, do we need to increase the process variance? We're looking forward to Yeah, Brian. I just wanted to um, shout out to Chris Legault wrote a, a simple, simple shiny app to test whether you can identify random versus non or versus biased residuals in age composition bubble plots. If you Google Chris Legault random uh, residuals or something, you might be able to find it and play that game yourself. Tell the SSD. Get more for SSD about that. Okay, any other comments on 
this particular topic or another one? Yeah, I, I sort of thinking about random uh, reference points and how many we want and how we develop the ones we want. So I have to say that stock synthesis has assisted people in deciding what reference points they want because they're the ones that stock synthesis can produce. Um, and I think there's, you know, that, that may not be a bad thing. Um, but I certainly, as if we move into the multi-species stuff, there really is no standards that we know of. And, and the points that were raised this morning about uh, BPA and stuff like that, if, if you know, the, 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 the multi-species world may, is great, but the reference points I think is gonna be really challenging. I'm not sure. If we build a multi-species model and then we say we can't calculate reference points, we're going to look like we're going to have mud in our face, basically. Okay. Any, any comments? So I got a question for the Bayesian people. So I haven't used Bayesian for a long time, so I'm, I'm not up to date with all the new techniques, but there's like Bayesian model checking or something. Oh, post your predictions. Yeah. So can you do the same thing in a likelihood context by simulating likelihoods and compare your likelihood with the simulated likelihoods? Procedure predictive checks are just fancy residual diagnostics, basically. Uh, okay, anything else? No. Any other topics that anyone wants to talk about? Okay, yeah, Jim. Um, maybe w one thing is on the, on the CPUE stuff, and Simon was talking about it, the, the notion of in, in the context of residuals and um, influence plots. And I was just wondering if, you know, Dean's presentation showing CPUE residuals, is that something that can be brought more into assessment context, or is it strictly kind of a CPUE type analysis. Um, I can't think of a way to, to introduce it into a, an assessment directly. Um, it is definitely a CPUE thing, or I guess any kind of statistical analysis, you could use an influence plot. What are you thinking of? Basically, what was the influence of the year, a year's data on the final answer? Well, I, I don't know how, exactly how to make make influence plots, but I've been told that they're de rigueur for CPUE analyses, and maybe it's something that um, should be looked at more carefully. And there's a way to bring it into diagnostics for assessments. Okay, um, yeah, no. So the first, so I can't really see the third bullet, uh, all of it. Uh, I'm gonna guess should a comprehensive set. So the first three, I, I, I mean, I would think for the next generation stock assessment model, the answer will be yes. Why would you exclude any of this? I would hope that the next generation model will be quite flexible in terms of the, and they're all linked really. Uh, one, the first two bullets are linked. Even current, you know, so Sam has this ability uh, and we rely quite heavily on multivariate distributions for fitting indices and age comps and that. So I, I would think this is just yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's good. So we've got, we've got some things to put on the list for the specifications. I turn this around and say how many of these things are no's. And the only one that I, and I feel weird about this, the only one I actually think, given what I heard, uh, is the MSC one, which I think 
you know, seeing what Ernesto did was, I feel much more comfortable about swapping models in and out. The temptation that if you've got, you know, st stock synthesis with an MSE component, you know, that sounds too easy to me. Uh, MSE is meant to be difficult. Um, so the idea of, of, I think that would, that would cause people to do bad things in my opinion. Yeah, Ernesto? going to say the same. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's, it's not a very good idea to have, well, again, depends on what you're calling a model here. Because if a model is a stock assessment model, then in my opinion, the stock assessment model should not have MSC, should not do the MSC. It should have the capacity to plug into an MSC if needed. So simulation, generation of, of parameters, uncertainties, all of that stuff. So you can use it for conditioning, it should have like, um, one thing we do, for example, with the A4A model is that we use this uh, capacity of not computing the Hessian, so you speed up things when you're using it in a, in a management procedure. So that's something you, you may want to have on a model, uh, just have a run where you really don't do the, the Hessian uh, inversion. So, uh, but definitely, if we are talking about the stock assessment model, the MSC should not be part of the stock assessment model in my opinion. Yeah, so I guess in the sort of sense of A4, um, what, A4, A and FLR, um, it's more about the framework and it's more about having consistency among the different models and input and output so that you can use different models for operating models, different models for estimation models. That, that's, uh, that was the idea of FLR. The initial idea was that you, you should have a a number of classes um, that, rep that are, well, solid to represent the data. So then you can build your stuff around those classes. And by having those data structures well-defined, it makes things uh, a lot simpler to, to, to share across different uh, models. Now, of course, the devil is in the details and uh, it's very difficult to do that. But anyway, that's the idea. And I think in the case of the A4A model, we actually took advantage of that to do that in the MSC. I mean, the other thing that, and I guess I'm thinking data poor here, um, and, and thinking Australia, where we often have single species in multiple areas, and they're probably fairly independent stocks, so we're not worried about movement, but the whole idea of being able to share parameters between stocks. So uh, even on the West Coast, you know, you know, the US, we occasionally will do an assessment of X and then take the growth curve from California and use it for the Oregon assessment, which is perfectly reasonable, except the uncertainty isn't propagated. So I think we, you know, as a, as a sort of middle step, rather than going all the way to multi-species uh, models, having the ability to have parallel assessments that aren't necessarily linked so that you can share mirror parameters between stocks, or at least put a, a hierarchical prior on things between stocks. I think I, I can see that certainly be useful in, in some of the contexts I work in, where you've got really a couple of data rich stocks and then these other things that you're trying to do work on. It's already in synthesis and modeling. It's usually what I hear <laughs> Jeez, Sanji, merciless. Um, I, I, with regard to multi-species, I, I see a need to more explicitly and transparently have predators in models. I, we've seen, I've seen enough examples where uh, change in predation pressure is something we need to account for as an M2 kind of component. And making that easier uh, and more straightforward is something I think we should do. Um, I'll continue to speak in favor of having a full feedback loop kind of analysis linked tightly to the assessment model. Whether we call it an MSC or not, I really don't care. Um, the MSC word is been so bastardized now. I, have, I get to tell people what it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but it's been used in so many different ways that uh, it's a little hard. Um, but in order to fully test, you know, the performance of an assessment system, you need to be able to do it with full feedback and doing it within the same model. I have no problem at all with using that to test the performance of, of that system. Uh, with regard to the total list here, and I, I guess we need to think of it in terms of uh, which things uh, do we not want. And I, 
hardly anything up there that I wouldn't want. Uh, but also, which things are ready to go into a standardized full uh, production model and which things are still at a research stage. So which things are, are ready to go, they're essentially off the shelf methods, we just need to be certain they're coded well going into the general purpose model. So which one do you think is close kin? Close kin for sure. Um, that we still don't know what good practices are. So getting back to the multi-species, so there's three things that came up about multi-species is sharing parameters, technical interactions, and biological interactions. So if we think sharing parameters is a good idea, you still have to model multiple species at the same time. Multiple stocks. Well, multiple st well they could be multiple species too. <laughs> so if you're doing that, why wouldn't you do technical interactions? And then if you do technical interactions, which are kind of easier than biological, then why wouldn't you do biological if you if you've already got multiple stocks in the model? I mean, I think the I'd like to hear from I guess Biaki's done it. We've done it. I mean, one of the things about multi-species models is the dynamics are just fundamentally chaotic. If you have a, a large amount of predation mortality, so you know, I, I, in Seattle, for example, I'm trying to remember to calculate mean n, you've got to do a loop of what, six or seven uh, calls to be able to get. The problem is that the numbers at age depend on natural mortality, which depends on numbers at age. Um, so you can't, you, you're not just running a model forward, you actually have to do some iteration to get that right, or use really short time steps. Um, so there's a, it, it's, a, it's a fundamentally different thing to do, particularly if you've got, well, it's cannibalism is what really kills you. Uh, what Rick is saying, I think is feasible, which is basically, you have predators almost as fleets rather than as dynamic things. Um, but, you know, Biaki, I don't know how Gadget deals with the, the high predation thing, but it, it, that's a, it, in Seattle, that's a significant add to the, the runtime. Well, all, all you're saying is true, uh, like always. Um, the, uh, the runtime is, is exacerbated. <laughs> No. Uh, <laughs> well, anyhow, the um, the uh, when you're doing this in gadget, it's uh, usually we we have a shorter time step. I mean, usually we're working it in quarters or monthly time steps. Um, so that of course increases the computation time and uh, consumption and growth is one of those things that actually kill the uh, the, the estimation time. So, plus all, all the fact that you also, you're adding a constraint to the, uh, you're adding a data set to the model, which is, which is already is a uh, fairly complicated objective function you need to optimize. So, I mean, usually what happens is in, in like a model like uh, Alfonso was presenting it, you know, we're talking about optimization times of now in days instead of uh, a couple of hours. So, so related to this then is, let's say you initially don't want to put biological interactions in your model. Um, do you want to have the underlying architecture capable of adding that at a future date? Adding, adding multi-species at a future date. So making sure that your current architecture allows that to happen, even if you didn't code it in your initial model. Yeah. Alfonso, yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> as I said during my presentation, I think because here, I, if I understand, we are talking about having the multi-species interactions in the stock assessment. I think <clears throat> that is very complex, yeah, because of all the, yeah, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> yeah, so really complex and in time it will take really long. I would think more as I suggested, like having a, it incorporated in the general model, but in like kind of uh, modeling those multi-species interaction in one side, and then you provide information to the single species stock assessment better than trying to do everything from the inside. And the, the problem of not re-estimating the numbers at age when you consider the traffic interactions is that you may end up 
uh, estimating consumption that are not actually the real numbers because you're taking numbers at age from single species stock assessment that are not recalculated to account for depredation. So that's why, yeah. Yeah, yeah just to say um, the Seattle model that we've, that's been developed by, by um, Jim Shop, um, I'm trying to remember when I was, I was running the, the single species versions of that run in literally seconds. The multi-species is what, about 10 minutes? What really kills us is we, we've got the ability, because it's TMB, we've got the ability to treat the rec, rec devs as full random effects. And once you do that, uh, TMB really slows down. But when you're just fitting the model, it's the three species model, full age structure, size structure, multiple fleets. It's maybe 10 minutes to do three species and we've moved to four and it hasn't really added a hell of a lot. But yeah, go to random effects and try to integrate it out. You get what you pay for. Is that about right as far as you're aware? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about Grant Adams' yeah. stuff, and I haven't tracked that too closely, but it sounds right. Yeah, no, it, it, it's fast if you code it in a 21st century language. <laughs> but I just had a question about, sorry. Yeah, I was just on the comment on there that says, I think there's also a distinction to be made here between a research or model, sort of uh, operating models for MSCs and an assessment model. I think having a uh, more complicated operating model is, of course, more valuable. And I, I see them to see this sort of, well, at least from the Gazi perspective, is that you, you can do this within the same framework. You can have a simple assessment model, and then you can have a more complicated one. And you can, but you can build on the work you've done on the simpler models. In, and, to, to create a more complicated one, or vice versa. Yeah, I mean that's true of Seattle. You can you can cut it down to a single spe single stock, single species. You can have three independent species, and then you can put the predation mortality in. So again, the scalability is is what you need. What we don't have, obviously, which Gadget has, is the areas. Yeah, Jim. All right, I just had a, a quick question on the, the, the claim about technical interaction models. I mean. Multi-fleet assessment models are accounting for different gear types. And I, I guess I'm a little bit confused, you know, for technical interaction models that we've done, they're for projection purposes where you'll have constraints uh, of different species affecting what can get caught. So it's, but it's not part of an, an assessment per se. I mean, the assessments are being fed into it. Yeah, it never was taken up, but the, the Robin Hood approach that we developed in Australia, where essentially uh, you've got multiple species and you've got the fleets that catch them. And essentially the thing that we did was, and this is before random effects, which I would have done it that way, but essentially that the trend in F, uh, the absolute Fs obviously depend on species and all sorts of stuff, but essentially the, fully, the trends in fully selected Fs by Metier or fleet or whatever you want to call them, essentially covers between species. So we were able to do assessments of species for which we had pretty crappy data by basically saying, you know, the trend in F is, you can steal from the data, the, the F rich. We got total catch, but really bad indices. So you, you basically know what the catch is, you know what the F is, um, and the F is treated as, as data. I mean, it's a, it's a latent variable rather than a the way we do it normally, but um, it actually was quite informative to deal with some of these sort of lesser species. Um, obviously, we don't have surveys like you guys do. So what about the case when you actually measure just the total catch and it's a combination of several species, particularly for historical purposes? I, I think that would be one of the benefits yeah, right. of, of that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pivot a little. Um, a couple other questions are with regard granularity of space and time. Um, we have spatial models, and I think we need a capability to have nested spatial structures. There are some kinds of data that apply at a broader spatial scale than others. And I, I'd like to see a capability to be able to deal with that. Similarly, on time, uh, we tend to set up models with one time step that happens, you know, some pattern of seasonality 
that happens every year. But I could see value in uh, when we're running long time series of having early years run annually and later years where we get lots of granularity of our data. Uh, and only in those years do we uh, refine down to uh, simpler time steps. So maybe there's not much time saving on that. But if we have the ability to you know, create the fine temporal structure where we need it and not be burdened by it elsewhere, and, we could, and if we can do that flexibly, it would seem to make sense. Yeah, that's what we've got in GMAX. Uh, we have essentially years, I mean, it's an option, it's not the default, but your specific time steps. So if you want to speed it up, and let's say there was a fleet that you bring in later on, you can just jump that fleet. So basically you have a zero where that fleet was, you just ignore it. Um, I don't think we've ever, Jim, we've never really looked at how fast that improves things, but because uh, most of our fleets have been there forever, but we, we can, we've got time, your specific time steps. Uh, and actually that didn't add much to the code. Um, well, yeah, so as far as flexibility and time is, there's a whole lot of different components to that, right? So you can, you know, typically what we do is an annual model or a seasonal model and they all have the same length. Um, but within a year, you could break it up into seasons where the seasons could all be different lengths. So you could have a season that was two days and a yeah. season that's yeah. the rest that's of the year. Yeah. And, um, and then what you're saying is also that should be able to change over time. So in earlier periods where you don't have much data, you don't do that sort of thing. Yeah. I'll tell you where this matters a lot is I, I'm working on a, if it would work, a size structured model, a multi area size structured model with MPAs and movement and all sorts of stuff. And I'm trying to calculate the equilibrium. Um, and I really don't want to have a whole bunch of time steps when I know that F equals zero in for all fleets, basically, I'm finding unfished equilibrium. So you can reduce the algebra a lot by having essentially smart knowledge of what the actual time steps are, because if there's no fishing, you don't need to have that time step, basically. So uh, I haven't got it to work yet, but I'm guessing it's going to be an order of magnitude improvement in speed. Yeah. So what about spatial structure? So currently, it's like big blocks we're using, but then there's a the big um, increase in use of the spatial temporal model, which is kind of a lot more uh, sophisticated, more, compli uh, more computationally intensive. So what from that should we include in the next generation model, or if any at all? I'm looking at you again, but uh, we had a postdoc uh, basically developed a population dynamics model uh, fitted around essentially the vast structure. Um, so it was a size structure model. I think we only had a few size classes at this point, but essentially it's a stock assessment that's fitted to data, but it's fitted, I think we had a hundred spatial zones going. Uh, again, lots of random effects. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't fast, I'll tell you that much. Um, but at least it replicated the data when we simulated it. You, you know, I, I don't know where that's going to go. Uh, Jim might actually have a better sense of that than I do. But conceptually, you can do it. Yeah, I mean, you're talking but, uh, Cecilia or Cole? Uh, uh, no, third postdoc, Maxine. Oh, no, I'm not on that one. Oh. This shows how much I know. Okay, so, so basically those models are sharing information among spatial areas, basically what you're yep. doing. So is this something that we should take for that for the next generation model? What, how and, and what should be shared among spatial regions in, in a stock assessment model? Before we go that way, I think we should talk data. So biggest problem for, I mean, if we're going to fit a model like this, you need data at really quite fine spatial resolution. So we're using the Bering Sea survey data, which are, there's, I don't know, 400 stations, Jim? I can't remember. Uh, oh, apparently 375. Um, so you've got a lot of data spatially, and each of those stations has got length data and stuff. But, um, you know, if I was thinking, can I apply a model like that to Australia Southeast, I'd be lucky if I know where the catch is within 100 miles. So, um, you know, I, I think these are great models, but I think I'm not sure how many places have got data over a long period of time with that kind of spatial resolution. So I think you might be just creating fancy population dynamics, but no actual knowledge. 
Anders is nodding, which may mean he's falling asleep. No, I, I have a comment in that, uh, on that in my presentation there, but so uh, uh, maybe I'll wait till there. But but um, I agree they require data. I agree they are they can tend to be slow if if you have. I think the tools we have for that has moved a long way in the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, there are extremely efficient ways to specify these if you have the suitable sparseness structure. Um, also, Dave once told me that you should develop for the next generation of computers, not the current one. And that sort of <laughs> makes a little sense, right? Yeah, Rich. Just wondering if you're getting down to those scales, is it worth thinking about moving to more continuum models as opposed to the sort of classical discrete in space and time we work with? And maybe some comments from John and the SPC folks on that front. Hi, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about uh, <clears throat> um, pure continuous models, but w we we do have some models that are highly resolved spatially that, that we've been trying to develop with uh, CLS in France for many years that <clears throat> take advantage of environmental drivers in movement. And so when you, when you get these huge number of spatial cells, it becomes a question of, well, how the heck do you parameterize movement um, and recruitment for that matter as well. But so if, if you can um, see and, and estimate functional relationships um, between environmental drivers that kind of define habitat quality for the species that you're interested in, that you're modeling, then um, you, you, you can in fact support these highly resolved spatial models. Um, so that's, that's the approach that we've been taking. I don't know if that's what Rich was, um, was getting at, but that, I think you know, having, having covariates essentially to, to, to assist in parameterizing movement is really essential in those highly dimensioned movement um, spatial strata. That's metric yeah. No, that's what I was thinking of and, and you know some of the things that I talked about yesterday in terms of being wacky especially in terms of you know migration dynamics that aren't, aren't going to fit into the kind of even quarterly style models but could be embedded within models of that type that it's definitely worth thinking about. Is that a general model or is that the general general model? So, so John you, you basically are modeling these um, block transfers with, among your different areas. Um, why do you do it that way? And why don't you like assume some kind of effusion defection model that's fairly consistent across all the different areas? Well, I, I guess that's, that's kind of what we're doing with um, the Cepidine model, which is this highly spatially resolved um, approach with the, the habitat drivers. Um, uh, I don't know, I think, you know, we started out from a stock assessment perspective in, in doing what we thought we had to do to capture that sort of spatial heterogeneity in, 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 in you know, what these days looks to be a fairly modest way because it's, it's, uh, it's temporally invariant. We, we, we might have a seasonal pattern of, in movement, but it, at the moment it's the same from year to year. And, and that's certainly an area that needs needs to be relaxed uh, in in some way. Um, maybe we can learn from the the, the sepidime type approach and, and seeing how that can be, you know, abstracted better into a, a general population dynamics model. So, yeah, good food for thought. Okay. Um, so, a related uh, point here about um, how to sh what to share and how to share information among spatial cells. Um, I know in the past uh, at SBC they've shared catchability among areas to be able to estimate the absolute abundance in each of those areas. Is that something you still do and, and is, was there anything special you had to do that in the general mo in the model to uh, make it work? No, essentially um, what we're trying to do is, is to use the information on relative CPUE among those areas to inform relative abundance amongst those areas. And the way you do that is through sharing of the catchability parameters. And, and yes, we still do that. Um, you know, we do, we do like to produce diagnostics to see if that's a, 
um, uh, an appropriate assumption to make, and it isn't in all cases for all different sorts of reasons, I guess, with fisheries and the way that they operate um, across these broad scale regions. But where we can do it, it's, it's actually quite a powerful um, method to, to get information out of the CPUE data in that way. Helps a lot. So um, perhaps one way of, of modeling like advection diffusion and, and across many spatial cells is basically sharing your movement parameters from spatial cells, right? So, you know, if you're moving left or right, you have the same probability of moving left or right in all of the cells. And then if you have some kind of deviates around that, you can sort of constrain the movement. Because I know, and I think Andre was talking about this in his talk about clines. So a lot of the uh, movement is not movement from, you know, a spawning area to a feeding area. I mean, some species do that and it's a lot easier to do, but a lot of the species we deal with, it's more clines. So there's more of a sort of advection diffusion of movement. Um, and it may be uh, ontogenetic or something like that. So is, is there a way that we can implement that in these, these models if we get not necessarily really fine spatial structure, but at least more blocks than we usually use in a spatial model? about um, thinking about this even more abstractly than just space. And this just becomes another movement in the partition one way or another. And you can apply forms and make them general depending what it is. And it doesn't have to relate to space at all. It's just how you think about it. And certainly in Castle 2, with um, the way that we're describing various parts of the partition, it's not specific to any of these sort, sorts of things. It's how you define it. Um, I know that sounds a bit waffly and abstract, but that's kind of my point. Yeah, so that means, if I, if I you heard it probably. No, um, I was typing and listening at the same time, so I might have got it wrong. Um, but that means that you have partitions and you have transfer among partitions. And so in a general sense, you know, if it's a region, then it's movement is the transition. But if it was sex or or um, um, species or anything like that, you have the same, <laughs> you're gonna change species, but um, the trend, yeah, yeah. So it'd be a general way of modeling transitions among um, partitions. So like, you, like I was mentioning for the area one, you can share that transition among different partitions. And so, yeah. Jim? Uh, is there anything we want to say about areas as fleet configurations as to whether, you know, that either there's more that could be done to, like, there, presumably there's some implicit movement aspects to it. And depending on if you have time varying, and, and is there more that should be done to kind of calculate the implicit movement or, or some, I think we should be developing diagnostics, which essentially, I mean, I think areas as fleets is fine when you're dealing with a data poor species because you don't want to go spatial. But I think it's important that we find ways to detect when the areas as fleets assumption is actually badly violated. Because obviously, if you're depleting one area and you're, you're ignoring that, sooner or later, it should pick it up. I just don't know how good our diagnostics are, but I think the question is, we should be moving away from it, but we're not going to be able to do that for everything. I've got a rule. Never use a CPUE index of abundance for an area's fleet. Yeah, so, so basically, when you, when you divide up an area and have a different fleet in it, and you are treating it as, the whole, as an index of the whole population, not of that one, and that'll probably only be reasonable if there's really strong ontogenetic movement so that the area that you chose sure. for that fleet actually has a different component of the population that you're measuring. But otherwise, don't do that. Yeah. Maybe you should never do it is what you're saying. Basically. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
So any other comments or new questions to address? Uh, I, I was just, it's, I mean, it's probably implicit in here, but just for the sake of it, that should be uh, compatible with legacy programs. I mean, maybe that's super obvious. So. Does, does everyone agree with that? What about, I mean, I, I lived through the transition from SS2 to SS3, and I think the way that was done was pretty darn good in the sense the dynamics were the same, but I didn't have to rewrite thousands of output files and input files. And actually, I did have to do output files. That was painful. But input files, I, I thought that, that you know, that, that you, there were things you just dropped from SS2 to get to SS3. I thought that was a sensible approach. Anything else? Yeah, Patrick. Yeah, just to follow up on Craig, I guess, what legacy programs are we talking about? Would you, would the next model be compatible with all legacy programs? That seems hard. So, so when you're talking about compatible, you're meaning using the same data format or being able to implement the exact same model, but maybe your data format and output and all that is different. Uh, maybe I could just yeah. jump in real yeah. quick. I, yeah. I think compatible can mean lots of things, but I think one thing that this workshop's taught me is that we could have a lot more translators between these tools and, you know, tools to do model comparisons. Uh, so, you know, I don't see a need to have, I mean, yeah, if, if, if it can be automatically translating models from any legacy to any future model, that'd be awesome. But uh, that doesn't have to be built into the model. That can be a separate external tool. But I, I think you know, designing the future models to, to facilitate that or keeping that task in mind as, as new things get built is all that we ask for. I think it's a real consideration when you're thinking about the resources you've got available to a project when you're moving forward and you're trying to keep um, a new iteration or in the case of moving from castle to castle two and um, what functionality are we trying to keep and move forward and being able to compare models between one moving into the next and to be able to verify and validate that and um, what tools do we make available that we can do that when we don't have a huge amount of resources to put into both projects. Um, so I think it does require quite a bit of thought as to how we manage that and put those in place. And we're thinking about how we do that at the moment. So these types of discussions are really valuable for us. Yeah, Nesta. It's, it's about something else. If you were going to say something on this, I was changing the subject. It's fine. <laughs> the, um, well, w one thing that um, I think should, we should make an, a serious effort is to stop using ASCII files. And uh, honestly, uh, it, uh, the output of a model these days has to be fed into a database. And that has the, the advantage, you choose whatever database you want, but that has the advantage that it forces people to actually think about the data structures of what they are outputting from their model. And hopefully, maybe it's a little bit related with what you were saying before, hopefully that will make uh, this capacity of transfer things across models uh, um, easier. And if we are thinking of jump, I, I think we all have that on the back of our heads that we need to jump into parallel computing and cloud computing. You cannot really deal with these things anymore. You need to have a database somewhere that you can actually upload your results without getting through the burden of saving files to disk, to a physical disk. OK. 
Okay, so how many of us old guys want to learn how to use databases? That's gonna that's gonna be the real challenge, I think, is to to bringing yeah yeah bringing people over to to actually doing it. Yeah. Ask is like Fortin seventy seven. It's great. It saved the world. But uh, we need to move on. Just have to wait till this table at the front retires, right? <laughs> In the front. <laughs> I'm sure you can link VI to a database. I'm pretty sure you can. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I, I certainly agree with the you know that that concept that you know greater uniformity in in our input and our output is uh, is needed. So on the input side, you know we have a quite a diversity of generic approaches uh, for, for the input right now. And uh, we've been working on developing translators, but I think if we could put our heads together and figure out you know, what's a, a good common system that is, uh, that is flexible enough to accommodate you know, you know, standard features as well as you know, sp specific features that particular models needs, uh, I think that would be a, a good augmentation for our collective effort. <laughs> well, I mean, just, just comment that, uh, you know, the, the ICS format is a collection of tables that are totally uncommented from the ones I've seen. Uh, we have uh, uh, JSON is being used by the, the U.S. effort of developing MAS. The CASEL has a keyword program that isn't, I don't know how, what it's working behind the scenes, but it's doing something like the JSON stuff. And then you have the, you know, more complex single file that require, you know, the right zeros and ones in all the right places for uh, multi-band CL and XS and BAM. And so we have you know, just a diversity of generic approaches that are out there right now. And you're trying to come to grips with a more uniform way of input for our models, I think, would be a benefit to the community. So are you thinking something like setting up a linear model in R? And I think R for, uh, A for all has something like that, right? <laughs> yes, so Rick, yeah, so Rick is saying we should have a, we should have a common format for sort of specifying models because everybody's got a different approach. Like you've got ASCII files with, and then you've got the there's a some funky thing that Pierre Kleiber put together, I think, for multi-fan. You've got uh, the Castle Two sort of template that you have more English-related ways of setting up models, and I think. Um, a for all has a sort of like a, a linear model type well, approach to doing it. We are talking about the, uh, two different things. One is the interface and the input things that you use for your assessment. The other is the output. I think it's a lot easier to configure common outputs than common inputs. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, what, what we did with the, in A4A was to, it's mainly that the interface uses the R formulas. And by doing that, you, you immediately take advantage of the fact that the R formulas have a specific development and a specific way of, of doing things and, and opens uh, the opportunity to do s stuff that otherwise would require lots of if statements and stuff like that. So, but that's, um, that's slightly different from the outputs. Um, not sure if I replied what you asked. But... Yeah, sure. Um, well, we, we've come, come, come to this at a little bit differently. We, we have a database system that has stores the data in a, in a minimally aggregated form. And then we have extraction routines that can be purpose-built for each modeling platform. So, for example, in our case, we have, we have gadgets sitting on one end, and then we have the database sitting on the other. And there's a translation layer that, that translates between the two. And in theory, this should also have work with stock synthesis or other species, depending on the data requirements and data needs that uh, each model has.
Yeah, and so I think Ernesto's comment about the interface is, is a good one. I mentioned this, I think, yesterday, but it's a topic I guess we should probably circle back to or discuss here is um, we, we get a little, we complicate ourselves by talking about all these different model input types, but if, if uh, you know, a professional program were to, programmer were to step back and look at what we're doing, our data is not that complicated. We have generally the same types of data. We have age data, we have length data, we have index data going into these models. It seems like a lot of effort could be put in up front to standardize the way that data is put in and even include a lot of error checking, a lot of all that sort of stuff. Our, our data is not that complicated. It seems like we should be able to feed it in in many, many formats, many different ways, as long as we just identify it as age data, length data, index data. Um, the system should be able to do something with it at that point. And I think there's a lot of value in spending time at doing that sort of coding. Um, that's where a professional programmer comes in, doing those user interfaces and error checking and all that. That's where we, we always fall short doing that. And that's what makes some, sometimes when we put these uh, software packages out there, it makes it very hard for users to, to start to use it because we don't put any effort into that user interface at all. Yeah, maybe I'm too old and remember too many databases have gone away and we've lost the data. So I think there's a real, if you're gonna do this, you need to think about ensuring that the data doesn't depend on having to Microsoft staying around forever and things like that. Um, those who on the West Coast will know we've tried to, you know, create archives and I think that having it, I mean, as, as, as bad as a text file is, at least we know we can read it. Um, whereas if your database goes away, uh, <laughs> you're in real trouble. So uh, thinking about legacy and making sure that you don't, you know, you can replicate your assessments going forward as much as possible, I think is, from my point of view, that's actually the most important aspect of, of output storage. I'm just wondering if maybe we should pose that question to the professional programmers around here because I think Ernesto's idea of some kind of database will potentially have the impact of imposing some kind of general structure that we would all have to comply with when we submitted the data in that form, but I'm not sure what sort of general data structures professional programmers have at their disposal these days and what sort of advantages and advantages and disadvantages they might have. So I'll pose that question. So this area you're discussing is a whole area in software development. It's generally referred to as ETL, extract, transform, and load in terms of data and databases. Um, there's a lot of different ways to go about it and positives and negatives to all of the things people have mentioned. Um, you can definitely still output your data in various forms and then have a central repository that you're loading it to and having different parsers that can read those in. And then your main database is basically allowing a place that it can be translated out again in various formats. Things have moved quite a lot. There's both um, like column-like databases as well as key value pair databases and a variety of things, including places where you just dump CSV files, but you're able to interact with them in a way where you don't see that and you can search them. So your initial output is still the same and it's still there and you're not going to lose it because it hasn't really changed from your point of view when you've loaded it into the cloud or wherever. But the way your computer or you would interact with it gives you another layer that you can search through all of it and pull out what you need. So I think that there is a lot you can do here that will impose that standardization, though I do think that even these different languages, they all pull in CSV, JSON, ASCII, um, even if you didn't put it into a database. So, but it is a whole area of expertise. Yeah, Nisna. Just to say that um, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that we should have, the same way I don't argue we should have one model that rules them all. I'm not arguing that we should have one database that rules them all. What I'm arguing is that if we are pushed into using databases, whatever they are, because the technology evolved a lot, people will have to look into the data structures. And by doing that, and as you said, these things are not so different. In the end of the day, 
we may come up closer to having something that is easy to transfer across different models. I'm not saying that it, we should now develop a standard database. I'm, I'm not as, uh, well, I'm also old enough to know that that doesn't work. <laughs> so uh, that, that is not the point. Now, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just, but uh, the, the truth is that just recently I came across some data on an, on an ASCII file for an assessment where missing observations were still stored as minus 99. It took me like a week to understand why the hell my stock is not converging. Well, I had minus 99 all over the place. It can't happen. It can't happen. You cannot be able to store on a file that the missing observation is minus 99. Everything's minus 99. Okay, anything else? Okay, so um, it's nearly lunchtime, so I think we might as well stop.